Yes. Welcome to Up In Your Business with Kerry McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Through storytelling and conversational interviews, this weekly radio show offers listeners first-hand insight in starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk-taking, and the commonalities of successful people. Connect with Carrie through her candid, often funny, and informative weekly blog, where you'll read and comment on life as wife, mother, daughter, and entrepreneur. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. For the next hour, my guest, John Kane, program director of KABF in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I will be getting up in the business of how John began his radio career half a century ago, about the John Kane Foundation and its mission, and maybe he'll tell us some stories about growing up colored in the South in the 20th century. Through our storytelling, you will hear how we maneuvered the path of leadership, entrepreneurship, and social, social change in pursuit of our dreams. And we'll be answering questions or giving advice via phone and email. My business experience began over 40 years ago when I founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, Arkansas Flag and Banner has grown and morphed from door-to-door sales to telemarketing to mail order and catalog sales and now relies heavily on the Internet. Each change in sales strategy required a change in company thinking, and procedures. My confidence, leadership knowledge, and my company grew. My initial $400 investment now produces nearly $4 million in annual sales. Each week on this show, you'll hear candid conversations between me and my guest about real-world experiences on a variety of businesses and topics that I hope you'll find interesting. Running a business or organization is like so many things. It takes persistence, perseverance, and patience. I worked part-time jobs for nine years before Arkansas Flag and Banner grew enough to support just me. It's now grown and expanded so much that to operate efficiently, we require, are you ready for this? A purchasing, manufacturing, graphic, shipping, technology, accounting, marketing, sales, and customer service department, plus a retail store. 25 people make their living from working at Arkansas Flag and Banner. I hope you'll take advantage of this unique opportunity to ask questions or share your experience by calling or emailing me and my guest on today's show. Before we start, I want to introduce the people at the table. We have Tim Bowen, our technician, who will be taking your calls and pushing the buttons. Say hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. My guest today is the Little Rock legend. Mr. John Kane, a man who has seen a lot, the Southern oppression of Jim Crow laws, the Kennedy Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, the formation of LBJ's Great Society, which encompassed the Civil Rights Movement, Watergate, and the dot-com boom. Through all this, John's career has stayed founded in radio. His job, his first job, in 1960, was working as an engineer and overnight disc jockey at Little Rock's R&B station, KLO, an AM station before the industry's move to FM. This beginning led Mr. Kane to become a familiar voice in central Arkansas for over half a century. Today, John is program director of the community radio station, KABF, FM 88.3, and host of KUAR's 52nd Street Jazz, 89 FM in Little Rock, Arkansas. In addition, he launched the John Kane Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to preserving African American culture and history in Arkansas. This foundation works closely with Arkansas Flag and Banner Sister Building on 9th Street, the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center, an African American museum whose mission is aligned with John's. Welcome to the table, the legendary Mr. John Kane. Well, Carrie. Thank well, you. I told you you'd like that intro. Thank you very much. I am thrilled to have this opportunity to get to, to get your oral history. You have done and seen so much. Any time during this interview that you feel like telling a story or sending it in another direction, since you're an old pro, much more so than I am, then just feel free to take over the show. But before we dig into your life, tell us how you came to be the program director at KABF Public Radio. 
once I determined to uh, do some positive things about things I never thought I could do things about before, but realizing that I had to change from commercial radio to public radio to do it, that was the beginning of a preservation initiative for me. It's how I became a preservationist bit by bit. But to start that, it was at KALO when I went and asked for a position, not to be described as a top 40 disc jockey, but realizing there was an opportunity there because although it was a small station, it was one of the first signals in the city, I think the first, about 1928, maybe 29, AM station, 1,000 watts in the daytime, 500 at night. So here I am, midnight to 5 a.m., doing basically the kind of programming that changed the perception of African Americans, mostly me, because I could reach out and get the product. People were looking for places to get that kind of stuff, black theater, not comedic stuff that made us look like buffoons, but stuff that really opened up their souls and they could express themselves. That's how I really got into radio. So the artist was the focal point. It wasn't about me. I'm basically an engineer at, right, at night reading meters, but I got five hours. On the, ra on the radio? On the radio. I put everything in there you could imagine. Jazz, blues, rock, Captain Beefheart. I might play anything, but it changed the dynamics of Top 40 radio. Before that, there were no ratings for nighttime radio. After Sonny Phillips and KAAY and those guys came on and they sh cut back on the power at sunset, they assumed that there were no, off no, no audiences out there. I wound up with, a, with captured audiences, nurses, the professionals working at night, people out and about at night. Why would they cut back their, their signal at night? Is it save money or something? Well, that was so... Inter there was no interference between the AM signals as they were basically digitizing for where we are now. FM, Internet, that was all coming. You could see it coming. In the 60s, you could already see it coming? I could see it coming. In the radio industry? In the radio industry. And, but to have the first signal with a big audience that wanted things differently than just the Ta mundane, everyday thing. It was the right place, right time. All that just fell into place, Carrie. And I fell in there. Bam. There I am. <laughs> Do you think you fell in there because of your hard work, because you were not limiting yourself, limiting thoughts? I mean, everybody that I interview that's an entrepreneur says, oh, I was lucky. But, and I know that is part of it. But a lot of it is ambition or a willingness to just do something. I mean, you started as an engineer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And work, so if somebody today was saying, I want to get into radio, and they're young, would you say just get a job at a radio station, wherever it is? Get a job, whatever it is. You have to begin somewhere in it to learn what it takes to make it all work. So, yeah, all those things you said about initiative, thinking. I grew up with radio. I didn't grow up with TV. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These, this, this time and, and age. Is so... As, um, as uh, one of those people that listen to radio, the family listened to radio. Mm -hmm. We extended storytelling. What I had on my side was a father who fought the Second World War, but he was a terrific storyteller. He could hold you spellbound on just telling you about something that happened to him down on the street. And so that was just an extension of this whole thing, like, hey, I could do that. But you didn't storytell. No, you I've never been a storyteller. Although you sound like one right now, don't you? Well, you know, I experienced a lot. And that sort of made me aware of how you conversate. Did you say I have a spiritual life? What did you say? Well, it, it made me really aware of what I could do with thinking things through and getting a focus on how would I present myself to a job situation? I wanted a life change. I'm in the South, 
not many opportunities. I grew up in the country, 12 miles from here, Wrightsville. So I just wanted to come in and be a different person. I was a quick study, I always have been. So in school, I liked civics because it gave really? me a sense of how business economics work, the kind of politics that go with that stuff. So from that, I wanted to explore the world. I was about ready to run away from home. At what age? Uh, and I just pestered my mom and dad until they just signed off the papers, and I became a sailor at 17. No way. Mm -hmm. Why is that not in the bio you sent me that you were a sailor? Now, that would have been great to know. Well, Where, for who? Not the Navy? Yes. Oh, I United see. United States Navy. They let you go into the Navy. At 17. And how long did you stay in the Navy? Just four years. But you saw the world. It opened me up to everything. And you decided to come back to Arkansas. So what did you see in your travels as a, as a Navy off, or a Navy person, personnel? What did you see that you think changed the way you think about life? I saw people in worse situations than I was in. I thought I was in a bad situation, but getting out into the world changed my whole perception. It also made me focus on Maybe I should be trying to help them, those kinds of things. And it eventually led to this. When I did, see, I was a seaman in the Navy. You know what a seaman is? Mm -mm. I was actually a boatswain mate. I had choice a to what? do boatswain mate. Okay. I ran boats. Okay. I ran boats for the officers. Uh, and to be a boatswain mate, you got to know all of the things that seamen do. You have to practice them, like painting, rope tying. We don't call them rope. Uh, we call Halyard. it line in the Navy. Halyard. Isn't so, that right? Mm-hmm. Mm mm -hmm. Hawser for the big, when, you, when you're tying the ship up. Okay. That's the big eight-inch line. But so in, in three and a half years, I went from a, uh, a person that didn't know anything about the Navy, although I had read a lot of books. I read all the books about the sea, Moby Dick, you name it, all of them. Three years before the mast, I wanted to be a sailor. Because of the adventure, not because, because you love to swim, yeah. but because of the adventure. Yes, that's how I wanted to see. And my dad was telling me these stories. So he fought in the Second World War. They built the Air Force bases in the tropics. Okinawa, Kwajalein. Black units were attached to the CB units, the construction battalions that went in there, scooped out. The road. So they worked with tools in one hand and a gun in the other. Wow. I bet he's got good series. stories. Oh, man, it was awesome when he tells those stories. I wound up in, the, in a similar situation. The war wasn't a world war when I got in. But was it in the Vietnam War? No, I went before the Vietnam War. I was going to say, I bet you were yeah, right before the right Vietnam before War. The Vietnam you war. lucky thing. Yeah. That's what, see, lucky. Oh, he <laughs> is lucky. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, That's your spiritual upbringing. Yeah. So it was kind of like a police action for me and stuff. It wasn't just all out war. I didn't really get shot at a lot, but I heard big shells going over us as we were out there running boats for officers, taking them from ship to shore or wherever they had to go. My two duties were choice duties running the captain's gig first on a tanker, AO-51. The tankers are named after rivers. Oh, I was really? on the USS Ashtabula. The Ashtabula is o Ohio River, one of the dirtiest rivers back in the 60s, if you remember. It actually caught a fire one time. It was in so the, On the river? Yeah. The, the water caught fire. Well, yeah, is that polluted. In Cleveland, Ohio, darling. Wow. But anyway, I was, on the, I was on the ships that came before the super tankers. They could hold triple the load we could hold. So uh, being a seaman on deck, we ran the winches that put the hoses over for the aircraft carriers, the cruisers, whoever came. We fueled at sea. We didn't fuel in port. We right. out in the sea rolling and doing that and crashing stuff and breaking stuff. It was terrific for terrific. me. Terrific. That sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't a war. I wasn't in a I don't she care if it was, was a war. That still, that still sounds awful. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about John's life afterwards. 
uh, we're going to hear about his career in radio, what he did after he got out of the Navy, about what his nonprofit is doing to preserve African American history, and hopefully get him to tell us some stories about the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with KABF's program director, Mr. John Kane. So, John, you already told me you were born in Wrightsville, Arkansas, but you haven't lived in Arkansas all your life. There was a time you did community theater and jazz preservation mm-hmm. in, I think I read, Alabama and Georgia. Birmingham, where I did most of it, darling. Yeah, Birmingham, Alabama. I want to tell our listeners that he calls me sweetie baby and darling every time you talk to him. He has a hip, cool cat from, I'm waiting for him to say groovy, from the 60s. And if anybody wants to write down how many times he calls me darling and email it to me at questions at upyourbusiness.org and your t-shirt size, I will send you an up yours (laughs) t-shirt from Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy because he calls me sugar and honey and darling and baby. So far, I think three times. That was your first tip for the day. So, all right, you had already gone into radio in the 1960s at, uh, what do you call it? K-A-L-O, yeah. K-A-L-O. Mm-hmm. Uh, not Cokie. Not Cokie. I, I never to, went to Cokie. I talked, I listened to Cokie, and, uh, and I listened to Beaker Street. Yeah. I did, too. I love Beaker Street, too, mm-hmm. but Cokie didn't have much uh, intellectual stuff in my head. My head was getting like that, Gary. Well, growing. you're a good reader, and you'd seen the world. So, so really, Cokie was more intellectual. That's interesting. I mean, Kayla was more intellectual. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, no wonder I didn't listen to it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, you, did, you started there, but you left and went off and did community theater and jazz preservation. Tell us a little bit about why that happened. Well, I'm, I'm at, at KALO. We have one of the top um, African-American radio people that grew up in Pine Bluff, Larry Hayes, returned from Milwaukee and took over KALO as general manager. He stayed a couple of three years, and as he was exiting, he was going to Birmingham, Alabama to bring WENN programming up to what he called Afrocentric. He was using this term Afrocentric. long before. Yeah. And, and because of the way the, the, the hosts on radio, the top 40 jocks did, there wasn't any room for real cultural stuff. So he asked me to go because... As I was, as he was coming in, I'm late night. He is the first person that come in every day. I'm working six nights a week. I'm going in at midnight, getting off at 6 a.m., go home, get a couple of hours of sleep, and go to work. Larry Hayes comes in. He is the early morning drive host. Before marketing and ratings were done, they were not taking overnight things. Immediately, when I got in that slot and changed the format to something that people really appreciated. Just say, change the world. Just go ahead and say, change the world. Change the world. And he realized that. So as he's moving to Alabama, he said, will you come with me? I said, only if I got a slot for jazz. It has to be all night. So I do the programming. We made that agreement. That's how I got there. When I got there. The community theater was big, Black Fire Community Theater down there. A lot of people who were living in Buffalo in the east, New York and around, were from Alabama, were coming back home. So we had actors, musicians, these guys out here working the major venues. They, had a, they were in the uh, process of developing um, uh, Jazz Hall of Fame. I became part of the promotion of that on the radio, helping to produce jazz shows. So we basically just had a paradigm shift, I guess you want to say. Did, but you didn't stay. You came back to Little Rock in But 19, I stayed eight years. Eight years. Eight years. It was eight years I got the community theater and all that preservation stuff. Did you do any acting? I was the chairman of the board of the Black Fire Theater. So I did You're most always of the, the chairman raising. of the board somewhere. Mm. <laughs> I did a lot of fundraising, and I was good at producing because I just worked hard to, to get good shows and get musicians' gigs that were not there before. And so that jazz community started to grow, man. It just impacted all of the other art disciplines. When I went down there, Carrie, 
I had a choice of living in the city, Birmingham proper, or uh, the verbs. So what I did, darling, I rode into the city every night, five miles on a bicycle. Just like you are today. Mm -hmm. And, and why so, did you do that? Well, I had to prove a couple of things to myself that I'm going to Birmingham, Alabama, and I really need to be just dedicated. I couldn't rely on somebody else. I had to do this the way I could do it. I know I can do it, and I just had to prove it to the people. That was the easy part. Uh, it did become uh, overwhelming as I started to interact with a lot of different disciplines, artists, you know, sculptors. So I had to change in my way of going to work. Now, I'm getting up at 1030 at night. I'm going to work. On a bike? On a bike. Why not a car? I had to prove that I could get there on my own. I, did, I can ride a bicycle. I rode a bicycle for all the years I was a kid. So I, I used to ride from Riceville to Alexander. You're the original millennial. So, so I just had to prove it to myself. It's not like I got to get there. And you weren't afraid? It's so late at night in Birmingham, Alabama. They're not exactly really nice to black people down there. Well... I'm a night person. Especially back I then. Actually, yeah, I actually live on both sides of the, the clock. The clock. When I say the clock, I'd rather be up at night doing things when I got myself just alone. I can focus. I'm not interrupted. I think things through. At night. You're a night person. I'm a night person. So I've always been like that. That's nice. And I, I just found a way to channel all of that into... I could do this myself. So you decided to come back to Little Rock? I come Why? back to Little Rock on the preservation project for the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. In Not 1984, you came back that long ago? Yes. For the Mosaic Templars? Mm -hmm. See, I started the Mosaic Templars project one year before I left Alabama. I'm still in Birmingham. I'm calling the Preservation Alliance up here, Bill Worthen and those people about, what do I do about saving that building? Yeah. My sons, who were still here, were writing me and telling me, Dad, they're cutting the 630 across, you know, that ditch thing, tear down the stuff. So they would send me photos. I said, man. So I left in 76. I stayed until 84. I come back about a month and a half before this station went on there. And then you started here as a volunteer. Started as a volunteer. I said, I'll help you out, man, because I know the, the demographics, the people. I said, but I don't do top 40 radio. They taught them, well, we need this. I said, I'm not that guy. So. So what did you do for a living? Worked. Where? Record shops. Peaches. <gasps> oh, peaches. <laughs> this is, you yeah. know, we're just, I can't believe we haven't been hanging out for before mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And so, they, you know, they had a chain. I also did the same kind of thing in Birmingham. The chain was in Atlanta, headquarters. So you didn't go back straight into radio? You did pretty quick. You got a job at KUAR, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, uh, uh -huh. Doing uh, jazz. Doing jazz again for them. And you're mm. still doing it, I think. I'm still doing it. Yeah. So how long have you been doing that? 30 years, I guess. Okay, so we've been on the air since 1984 here. I probably went there in 86. So that's exactly 31 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're both yeah. thinking about yeah. that. Yeah. You said about your early days on radio, and I quote, I featured material that you don't hear normally. It was overnight radio that really gave me the opportunity to become a preservationist of sorts, a musicologist, a mixologist, or whatever you want to call it. So when I think of a preservationist, I think of, um, you know, buildings. You know, like you'd say the Mosaic Templar. Are you thinking about music or are you using preservationists for buildings too? Everything that is old that you want to that's say that's an art a craft discipline because that's what it is i mean it's a it's a it's a vehicle that anybody that want to dedicate themselves to a specific part of that you know you make it work for yourself it's, it's your dedication to make it work so i i just i just embrace it all mm -hmm. you you have a specific genre in music you like and i think it's jazz isn't it's that jazz right? mm -hmm. um so you've seen, and you're talking about old school jazz, not Kenny G, 
Not cool jazz or whatever they call the mm -hmm. stuff that because smooth jazz. Yeah, yeah, smooth jazz because if it's not um, intertwined with the the eras and timelines of jazz itself, the originals. The originals. The 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 older musicians don't really accept that as a new genre. That's like country music. There's a old school country music, and then there's the new country music. And you know, if you're a purist, you like the old yeah. country music. Mm -hmm. So I became an audio power purist kind of person. Uh, You've seen a lot of changes in radio. Uh, what did a studio look like back then when you first started compared to today? This our studio? No, all studios. Did the headsets look like this? Did the boards look like this? Has it gotten? Has it changed much? Yeah. The boards didn't have sliders, they had knobs, you turn the volume up, you know, just things like that. They were not composites like these materials are now. They were American made. Oh, and these are all probably made in? Metal, yeah, these are made everywhere. So when a slider goes out here, you can't repair it. You used to could do that metal to metal with spray, contact spray, clean it off. If you do that now, it welds together. So wow. <laughs> you have to buy a whole damn new part. That's, that's speaking like an engineer. Plus, you know, we've got audio, uh, we've got call in. Did you have call in back then? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had call ins. We you did everything. We did just like we record the, the transmitter reader. We had a phone connected to the transmitter. So call. it really hadn't changed a lot. Mm -hmm. The industry really is one of the industries that hasn't changed a lot, except for we use computers now. Yeah. How would you navigate or work the board if you didn't have a computer? Because Tim looks at the computer all the time. Well, me being old school, if I'm not hands-on, I'm not going to look at a new attachment that you mm. got to learn how it works. Mm -hmm. I know how practically to get a sound out of any channel without a computer. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's preservation, too. It, it's I refuse skill. to let it's go of it because there's there's sound quality that really holds people's attention. It's a skill when you do it's it a that skill. way. Yeah, and if you don't know what a good sound quality is, I mean, you, you're not getting it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I avoid it. Mm -hmm. If a you if a music director, your, you won't even answer your emails for mm -hmm. two days. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but so if a if a if a label or a person sending me something says, "Oh, it's MP3," I said, "Man, I don't worry. I want the hard copy because I can do a lot of things with hard copy." Are you talking about CD or di uh, yeah, a you DVD? Know, the digital stuff, baby. Uh, oh, yeah. oh. So if they they send a sound, I I got this great sound. I said, "Man, I'm not going to use it." What do you well, mean a hard copy? You can't get a record up here. No, hard copy is a CD. Oh. Say a, a CD as okay. opposed to an MP3. Oh, I get you. They send them from their phones, which don't have the quality. I'm looking for sound quality because I don't want to spend time listening to something that sounds bad to my ears. Oh. So I'm not going to recommend it to Tim. I'm going to say, hey, man, send us the hard copy. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's a good, I didn't realize that. So that's changed. You don't, you don't have records up your spinning. That has changed. Yeah, that has changed. We found a change. There's no turntables with records spinning, although I bet there are some stations going back to that now. There are. And there's shows here on KBF where the DJs bring turntables Turn up here. Yeah, now, so turntables are in here. Rural War Room. Mm -hmm. They bring their yeah. own turntables. Who does? A Tuesday night show, Rural War Room. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so we got a turntable sit back there, dual turntables. Donated, uh, probably well, they were probably a thousand, what's a thousand dollars? But we won't put them in here because they would be ripped up. The the the, the rappers doing that, man, that's hard on equipment. So oh, I see. What you're doing do that is is scratching the record. Scratching the record. That's what it is. Scratching mm -hmm. the record, which I makes got the it bad. Lingo down. So I would <laughs> rather listen to a scratch on a record that's been played ten thousand times. That somebody yeah. really cared about right you know. mm -hmm. uh, this is a great spot to take a break when we come back we're going to learn about john kane's foundation a nonprofit dedicated to preserving african-american history and get him to tell us some stories about the cultural revolution of the 1960s and 70s you're listening to up in your business with carrie mccoy my guest is the legendary mr john kane program director of kabf radio in little rock up in your business with carrie mccoy i'm speaking today with kabf's program director mr john kane 
So, John, you kind of already told us that you came back here to save the Mosaic Templar. I, maybe that's how, why you started your foundation, but tell us how the John Cain Foundation came to be. Okay, first, there was a preservation society that did the campaign work for the building. I didn't put the foundation together except for two years ago. Here's what I was Two years ago from right now? Mm-hmm. Here's what I was told when I come in and says, I, as I tried to convince people, come on and help us do this. They say, well, you need a foundation. I say, you got it exactly backwards. We want a society of people. If I'm putting together a foundation, that means I got to buy the building. We can't buy the building. We want the programs and that protocol and procedural stuff that make it, uh, that puts it in a perpetuity window. As long as somebody's working on it, state funds it, the building is there. And the building being the Mosaic Templar Mosaic Cultural Templars. Center. Now the foundation was put together because in the legislation carrier that made it a, a museum and cultural center, there was a part of the legislation that called a business incubator. Oh, concept. small business incubator. Small business incubator. So that's the foundation's initiative. In other words, we are actually trying to recreate what John Bush and his partner, Mr. Keats, did. In 19... In, eight, in the 1800s. Eight, late 1800s. Yeah, when that came together. So we're actually going chapter and verse about, okay, we need to do it as close to... You mean reading the old book that he originally, chapter and verse, meaning reading his old book and how he... How, how they put the business together and stuff like oh, that. Oh, you're recreating his vision. Recreating the vision. Oh, so, I love it. So on the way to getting the building restored, of course, you know, the big part it was a tragic fire we had, which destroyed the original building. That was so much like that building you got now. Mm, I know the, the building. I've been in it a the lot. The Hall. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I feel things that a lot of people never been in it before don't feel. You it's know what very I'm spiritual. Yeah, it, that's what I'm saying. And so to lose that building devastated the society, but we were able to hold it together. The thing that kept it together because we had real historians, real educator people that knew people, taught people, the kids, and they became business people, had businesses on 9th Street, and we had a million dollar policy, Lloyds of London. On the building before it burned. On the burned. building before it burned. So we just call a, made a call meeting, got the legislators together, Went to the rotunda over there and, and asked the governor and the legislators, match this for us so we can build a new building. So we went from restoration to a new building. That's what actually happened. And you had feeder money because of your insurance claim, mm -hmm. which you probably wouldn't have gotten before. Right. So in some ways it was a blessing even though you lost the Yeah, original. we lost a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you walk upstairs to the Dreamland Ballroom... Your skin will crawl. Yeah. The hair on my arms goes mm -hmm. up. And not everybody does that to you. Mm -hmm. but First time we went in the building, we went in with May Construction Company. Which You're building? Uh, Mine the, or yours? Uh, the, the Mosaic Templars building, mm -hmm. the original building. Um, it was dirty. What really prompted me to, to start the process was I knew what went on in that building before I left and went to Birmingham and Atlanta. When I come back... Uh, I just took what I do and started to organize. The reason why, because I worked in the building when they had a machine shop on the first floor oh, down there. Oh, at Mosaic Templars? Yeah, yeah. Yes, they, I remember that, they had yes. had the machine shop. Mm -hmm. Well, the building across the alley from it used to have all of their auto things before AutoZone came. Auto parts. Auto parts. And they had them all the way up to the third floor, so we go up and pull orders. They said, oh. you can't go into the, we don't want you on the, on the third floor, we go up to the second floor. So I went up there and saw all of that. It just brought me just straight to the, like the, um, Tavorian Hall. I used to go in there as a kid, go upstairs, the waiters club, late night when all the waiters off. Mm -hmm. That's where it was happening, mm -hmm. the music and stuff. And it just made me really uh, work hard. It took four years now. Once I after, hit the you got here. The, after you got the million dollars, it took four no, years? No, no. After I come back from Birmingham, okay. it took me four years to really organize 
people said, come on and help us. That's how we got our 501c3. We got the right people who wanted to see that happen. That's how we did it. That takes some organizational skills right there. Well, man. we were timely in that backyard burger wanted to come in from Memphis, buy the building, tear it down. When they did that, we made a call to action. David Jones with Flake and Company. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my gosh, I can't think of his name now, but he worked. Uh, Bill Worthen? Not Bill Worthen. Uh, worked for, uh, he owned the building. Oh, he owned the Mosaic Tankers? He, he actually owned the building. We got a partnership agreement with him and the, bill, and the city to help the society save the building. Well, that was nice of so, him. So, yeah, so we asked him. We didn't have office space. The city gave us office space at, second, at, per, at, at Markham and Maine. Is that the Arkansas Heritage Building? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it the Arkansas? Because I, I know the Arkansas. Because I know right now it's it's under your building is in the Department of Heritage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but because your emails say Department of Heritage. Yeah, but there was we didn't have office space. Tommy Jamison was instrumental in that. Once we got the top architect in the state. Yep. Restoration. Uh, we felt good about all of these developments. We kind of celebrated amongst ourselves. I mean, that wasn't much you could do. What's next? What's the next thing we do? And that's how we rolled that thing out. Well, organizing people for a building is hard. Yeah. It's not like, you know, sick children or starving children or it's a building. with. It's very important to save, but it doesn't quite pull at your heartstrings like some other nonprofits do. So I really admire you for doing that. What made you decide to do the John Cain Foundation two years ago? Well, the John Cain Foundation wants to do this incubator business breakout. So we're developing programs to help start up businesses. So That's you can get grants. So you had to start a grant. foundation so that you can get grants. Mm -hmm. You can apply for grants. Who's doing Tuesday. that? Are you doing those? Are you applying for the grants yourself? We got it. We are, we're applying for one C3. And who's applying official. for the grants to start these small businesses? Well, Do we got a grant writer, up? yeah, uh, on some specific program things, and we're looking at the disadvantaged kids as a way to really. In Little Rock? In Little Rock and the entire state. In the state of Arkansas? Yeah, as a way to develop programs for because they don't have opportunities and they're in bad situations. Yeah. And how do you help them? Well, let's get a program in. You know, most of them, a lot of kids don't realize, because I'll do tours sometimes with kids, and one of the things they love to hear about me is, is that no, is, is nobody really has a plan, mm -hmm. and they just, that they can do, they can do it too. I think poverty children have limited, have limited uh, visions for themselves. They do. And when you have a, and that's one of the things I love to talk about is, you know, don't have those limiting thoughts. You know, you're just as good as everybody else. And if you work hard and go to the right places, even if you get a job as an engineer, you may end up being a radio personality that changes music in America today like you. Who knew being an engineer and you were going to change the world? You know, um... They can't think like that. They look at things. If if I had not had good mentors. Your parents. My parents, starting with them, and then meeting other people. I was put in programs as a kid in school. Charles Bussey uh, put me in the junior deputy sheriff program. Mm -hmm. I was a junior deputy sheriff and not a Boy Scout. So I actually was the little chief of our little junior deputy sheriff in Wrightsville. We'd come up here to the courthouse once a month, have a meeting in the chambers, whatever person was in there, judge, any legal person. Those mentors just showed me how to pull this, this, this stuff I'm reading about civics together, how to do things. So I didn't really ask people a lot of questions. I thought I had it figured out in mind. I would just start something. Just start.
start. Uh, just start. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. Just start. Yeah. If you're laying on the couch, you're never mm-hmm. going to start. You're never going to start. So before we take a break, and then I want to come back and talk about race relations in America, a very sensitive subject. But you and I are friends. This is a safe place. I'm a safe person. You're a safe person. We're going we're gonna to talk about it. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, you were invited to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I love their slogan. A people's journey, a nation's story. Is that not great? Yeah. Did you love going up there? Yeah. It's was it? Was how'd you get invited? Just because you're a rock well, star? Well, here's what happened. Um, working with the University of Central Arkansas Fine Arts Department and Annie Abrams, we want to celebrate Annie Abrams' birth, birthday, right? She was one of the Central Arkansas so, nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not not Central nine, High but one of the co- commissioners that you know made the thing a, a part, got it into the Wasn't national. she a Central High School, one of the nine? Uh-uh. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I thought not, she was. Not Annie. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Annie's uh, about four years older than I am. Oh, okay, yeah, never so mind. So she's then. about 85. She'll be 85 in September. Oh, good. He told us how old he was. <laughs> <laughs> He's 81. So, I did the math. So it was that thing that got us focused on, okay, they're going to have a real thing. It, we knew that they were working on this building, getting funding for it. It was a long time to make it come to reality. And so we said, okay, let's take a busload of Arkansans up there. We got with Pat Ward Rogers and uh, start organizing bus trip, you know, lodging, all that stuff. To see the museum itself, I've probably seen more ephemera. That's what they call what is exhibit that? stuff oh. before it becomes uh, the the finished uh, display. Uh, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and so I've What'd seen you call it? ephemera. Oh, okay. Learn new word mm-hmm. today. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not a historic or uh, piece yet until it gets in the place to be viewed. Oh, okay. And analyzed up. So that's what. They've got in these departments where they keep their artifacts. Okay. It, it's ephemera in the buildings where they store it. It's on exhibit when they bring it out. Oh, nice. Thank you, John, mm-hmm. for educating us. I learned I learned so much of this. It was incredible. I'm, I never thought I would be learning about preservation, and I was actually doing it. Yeah. It's weird, darling. Okay. Seriously. There's another darling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was, it was a... It wasn't like it was a crazy weird, but I'm in this place where I never really thought I would be. Mm-hmm. I love just it. Just from what I knew. So we're going to take the fastest break ever on the planet. Uh, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the Cultural Revolution and Mr. John Kane's opinion on the state of affairs of the African American Community Day. Today, you're listening to Up In Your Business. My guest is the legendary Mr. John Kane, program director at KABF Radio in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was going to ask you now to tell us how old you are, but you already did. You're 81, I gathered, right? Right. Getting close. 80? Oh, you're 80. <laughs> I'm 80. You're Getting like close. a millennial, though. You walk everywhere you ride the bus you're an 80 year old millennial you live downtown you're living the life that all millennials want to live these days you've always been hip darling well thank you you're welcome you've always been hip i mean you you really have but i learned it from nature carrie i'm a, i'm a naturalist if you want to call it that but i grew up in the what we call the country now i didn't grow up on a plantation i didn't I was poor, but I worked all the time, so I had money in my pocket. My honest money. Honest money. Honest money. I worked for it. I didn't do something crazy just to get it. I had my grandfather as a mentor. Your my father. Mother. Where was your father? He Here. passed in, dad passed in 70, 1970. My mother passed four years ago, so she lived, she died in 94. Well, how old was she? Na- she was oh, in 94. She was 94 she was, oh, she, she was 94 when she passed. So she lived 40-plus years after my dad passed in 1970. He passed on a stroke. Well, no wonder you got such good genes. I'm a lucky guy. You, are, you keep saying that. <laughs> and you just keep saying it, brother, because that's what makes you lucky right there. Okay, I'm going to give a warning. For the next few minutes, you and I are going to have a candid conversation an uncomfortable conversation for some. So this is a warning to our listeners. But anybody that knows me at all knows that I'm a safe person. This is a safe place. This is not to say that everyone has to agree with me or John. 
After all, this is America, and everybody gets to have their opinion. So let's start with what I think is the hardest question first, and then we'll lighten up. Something people don't like to talk about is racism, mm -hmm. and it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. buying the Taborian Hall, I found out the hard way. I'm the white girl that bought a significantly important African-American building, and I, I just want to say that it kind of hurts my feelings. I wouldn't worry about that. You're, done, you're doing the right thing. Thank Were it not you. for you, Carrie, that building would not be there. Oh, see, that's what I want someone to tell me. Thank you, John. You and I are both interviewed in the Dreamland documentary that's airing on PBS. And I see you every week at this radio station. So we have become friends and sometimes talk and sometimes rant about black and white relations in America today. Our discussions often end with you saying, we can't forget our history lest we repeat it. And me saying, white people want to quit feeling guilty about what our ancestors did and move on. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I can. Uh, racism is a many layered thing. It begins with tribalism, which becomes eventually classism. You know, that whole thing of dividing people up so people want certain things. Uh, once I really got the definition down of what this is, instead of hating, I just decided to embrace everything. The things that I don't like, well, you know, I just get away from it. I want to, I'm looking for the positive. You really are. So rather than, than be fighting with people about my rights, I'm just going to do what I think is the right thing. So I can embrace it all and make a decision that way, not have popular opinion change my way of living. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I say that, I mean, uh, that's why I want to stay close to nature. So when you see me walking down the street, I'm not actually looking for a ride. I'm actually assimilating nature. So don't offer him a ride if you see him. Don't offer me a ride. I'm going to get where I'm going. And live uh, forever. On a snow day, I might walk three miles to get here when other people can't or won't come. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm driven by nature, really. Mm -hmm. Most people think I'm just being casual about it, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, I prefer cooking my own organic foods the way I want to eat Man, it. And he is an 80-year-old millennial. After the 60s and 70s revolution, I think many people thought equality for all at last. I know I felt that way. I know LBJ thought that when he tried to create what he called a great society. LBJ's quote is as follows, a great society is to build a great society, a place where the meaning of man's life matches the marvels of man's labor. You are exactly an example of that because you work hard and you've had a wonderful life. But shortly after LBJ passed the 1965 Voting Rights Act, became the era of riots and destructions of property by African Americans on their own business districts and neighborhoods. You were a young man living during that time. It was a little before my time. Can you tell us how you felt and give us your theory on what happened? I was uh, scared about you know it happening in my town. When things are, when you're removed from things, Detroit on fire, it wasn't as serious, but although I'm getting friends returning home because they lost their jobs, they lost things, they wanted, they made a reverse uh, migration. Oh. See, the migration of blacks to the large cities went on for about 70 years. How many years? 70. Yeah. And so when LBJ implemented that policy and, and stuff and, and people didn't get what they wanted, that's when the large cities went on fire. What okay. did they not get that they wanted? I don't know. The, I have no the, idea. The program wasn't implemented immediately. Yeah, he made, they made the legislation happen, but it was 10 years after before a lot of that stuff was actually implemented in the neighborhoods that they were in places where they needed to help people. Oh, really? Yeah. For instance, in 1962, I saw Grambling College football team on TV. That was a major breakthrough. That marching band. Is that an African-American school? 
Grambling College. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. In what, 1962? In 1975, I was calling football for Grambling College on the radio. Oh, my gosh. I am going to rewrite your So I bio. did that about five years. The thing I'm trying to show you is, yeah, he implemented legislation, but it took a while. And so people like me waiting to see this happen, it never happened. I was still doing the same things I wanted to do, just striking out on my own. Were you frustrated? Yeah. But you didn't want to burn your city down. I didn't want to. I never. I never burned the city. Never burn. Never. Never do anything. I did anything that took me on crazy, frustrated marches. Now, when Acorn came into uh, being in 1970, I was one of the few people outside of the usual block of on-air people that talked about their programs and stuff. They couldn't get any, any help. The local news, TV news, call them that local group. They wouldn't identify them as, oh, this, this is an organization out here. And I don't think a lot of people know ACORN. The A originally stood for Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah, and it became a nationwide program. Nationwide program. Started, by the, started by the same guy that started this radio show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to be doing that was, I guess, what I was supposed to be doing. I was supposed to be out there, out in the street burning buildings. I went on a few marches in Birmingham. But Acorn wasn't just about black people. It was just about, it was about poor people. Poor people, yeah. marginalized people, uh-huh. losing their housing. Which I guess probably was mostly African Americans, probably. A good part of them. Look at what happened to Ninth Street. Yeah. And it impacted. And then they moved a lot of the people out to the suburbs. That's where they usually wind up, but... Yeah, when I moved down there to Ninth Street, I learned uh, from you probably know him, Milton uh, Milton Crenshaw. Yeah, he, he mm-hmm. was the first gentleman to come see me, and he was adorable. He had an M and an H on his two front teeth. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And he took me down and showed me where his building was and where his wife and him had lived and all of that. And he said he lost his business when uh, his customers started shopping on Main Street. He said, I lost all my customers. So after desegregation, I learned from being down there that the African Americans began to shop on Main Street. The white people decided to do white flight and moved out to the suburbs because the African Americans were shopping on the Main Street. And and then the poor black business district just lost all its customers. Lost all its customers. And folded all across America. Yeah. I don't think people realize that that's what happened to most of these African American black business districts. I think that was a pushback. Yeah, I think that was a pushback from LBJ's. Uh, well, I think they were just shopping price. Working. Well, that too. Uh, I mean, look what Walmart's done to small towns. Yeah. I mean, you come in with a good price. I mean, this mom and pop cannot compete with Walmart. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the African American stores could compete with the white stores. They couldn't. No. Nope. Uh, on price. Uh-huh. But let me show you a, a, a thing that, that went on here. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you met Milton, yeah, he was there frustrated. Mm-hmm. When I come back on the, on the, on the Mosaic Templates Preservation Project, he was one of the first people I went to because I used to patronize his business. That's why I took my clothes every week. It was a like weekend thing. Take your clothes down there, get them clean, get your shoes high. So I tell Milton, I will, I'm, I'm going to organize this effort to, put, to save this building here. He's right across the street from there. And ask him if he would help. He was so frustrated. He said, "I don't have time." Why? Hey, he saw the vision. All his business partners being pushed off the street. So he moved to 15th and Ringo. I still took my clothes to him and stuff like that. But I never could get him to join the society. Committed. He would not join. I think he was burned out by that time mm-hmm. by so many asks from different people mm-hmm. and things like that. And you know, he was a great teacher he taught uh, not just showing people how to fly airplanes but he taught at Philander Smith College so he went through that thing and it just devastated me he didn't want to do any more business he didn't he didn't want to oh you now, know I Milton Crenshaw is the, I'm mixing my guys up Milton Crenshaw is the airplane pilot he's the airplane guy so the guy with the M and the H that came to see me was Milton somebody else I think I have mixed my two people up mm-hmm. yes I got to know both of them really well okay yes. yeah and so Milton, Milton was a good person. As a matter of fact, I sat on a board that we formed for his foundation, this Air Academy thing that Terrence Bolton put together uh, until he died recently. So 
Oh my gosh, our time is up. Oh, is I it? just noticed. Okay, you have got to come back because I didn't get to a lot. We didn't even talk about the mindset of people today and get your wisdom and advice on what we think you and I can do. You've got to come back. We've got to talk again. You're here, so I'll just get you any day. And I'm going to rewrite your bio because you don't have enough. You have done so much stuff. So, John, I've got a cigar for you. Oh, oh. I know, but I left it in the car, so I'm going to give it to you after this. Okay. I want to thank you. It's really been an honor. And the cigar came from the humidor room at Colonial Wine and Spirits on Markham Street in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and the cigars for birthing a new radio program and genre for your nonprofit, the John Kane Foundation, and for all you do in our community. Who's our guest next week, Tim? Our guest next week is going to be Richard Deutsch of Piano Craft here in Little Rock. Oh, he's a, he's a fun, fun guy. Uh, if you have a great entrepreneurial story you would like to share, I would love to hear from you. Send a brief bio and your contact info to questions at upyourbusiness.org, and someone will be in touch. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program has been about you, you're right. But it's also been for me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of flagandbanner.com. If you miss any part of the show or want to learn more about UIYB, go to flagandbanner.com and click on Radio Show. Like us on Facebook or subscribe to her weekly podcast wherever you like to listen. All interviews are recorded and posted the following week with links to resources you heard discussed on today's show. Underwriting opportunities available upon request. Carrie's goal is to help you live the American dream. Oh,